thank you very much for having me. I, to be honest, I wish I was not giving this lecture. Uh, you know, uh, Shaybal was one of the people I admired, and uh, I was, as I was saying, it's a one of it's a to me it's a moment of chagrin to think that I'm giving the Shaybal Gupta lecture. Shaybal was just a few years older than me, so he, he's he's there is no. For me, there's, there's no justice in the fact that we don't have him with us here organizing another lecture. Whenever we met, he, uh, he made me promise that I'll come back and give another lecture in, in Patna. And, and, you know, I always said yes, because I remember when uh, the few times I've been, been to Adri or a few times I've enjoyed his hospitality, it's always, the first uh, international conference that was organized in Patna where I was present on development economics. I always found his company and uh, the intellectual environment he sustained stimulating. And I always said, yes, I'll come back. And I would have liked to have come back to see him and not, not for this. Um, nonetheless, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's, he will be much missed. Um, this is a lecture that I uh, had given before, but I thought of it giving it here uh, because I think it's very close to Shaival's interest. Whenever we met, we talked about you know the history of Bihar and where it, both the long history of Bihar, of course, which he was very proud of, the fact that this was uh, you know Patliputra and uh, and the uh, more recent history and the history you know i'll come back to that uh, the point he often made um, uh, so i i, I it, it may occur to me that it might be an interesting to to talk about this theme of you know history and the role played in history of of by history in development economics so i, I think that It, it, I think there is a lot of, I think, interesting and important recent work by economists, uh, which are, in a sense, against development economics. Uh, so I, I think there's, a, there's a, a, a large body of work which basically says that, you know, uh, the kind of uh, activist policy oriented work that we do, for example, in, in the Abdul Latif Jameed Poverty Action Lab is sort of beside the point because, um, you know, or that, you know, the, the, the various different, the key differences that, you know, historians emphasize and development economics emphasize the difference in strategies. All of this is a little bit beside the point. Uh, if you like, there's no path, but the path. Uh, and I, I think that line of research, um, I want to argue that he, while the important lessons from history, and, the, and I want to go back to Shaibal's view that history was very important in Bihar, and I want to agree with that. I think there are, uh, I would argue for a very different use and interpretation of the historical evidence. Okay. So I think here's the starting point. The starting point is a very important body of work, recent work showing that the, that the, uh, the, showing the long arm of history, that history has, you know, you, you can't escape the history totally. The history does seem to have durable effects. And I'll come back to that point about durable effects uh, multiple times. And I think there is, a, for example, there's work showing that Countries that were colonized by the British have British style legal systems. Countries that were colonized by the French have French style legal systems. Uh, there is a, uh, there is a labor, labor laws uh, in uh, Engerman and Sokolov's work suggest that labor laws uh, where, where the labor laws were set up to be more anti-labor, they tend to be more anti-labor over time. Um, this very important work by my colleagues, Asimo Blue Johnson and Robinson, um, suggesting something deeper, suggesting that, um, in fact, uh, the, uh, 
it's, it's not just specific institutions, it's the whole culture, whole institutional frame that, that persists. So if you start in an institutional frame that's, that's based on extraction by the colonists, then that remains, even though you're decolonized, the next generation, the post-independence uh, leaders uh, adopt the same strategies and therefore the extractive institutions persist. We have uh, this is this is this is this is an idea that, for example, I know that I talked a lot to uh, Shaibal about because we have a paper arguing using very you know very uh, local variation and micro data from India, suggesting that areas like Bihar, which had the zamindari system, have evolved very differently from the places in India which had the Rayapuri system, like. Maharashtra, parts of Madhya Pradesh, et cetera. So that, this, that it makes today, if you look at India at places that have the zamindari system and places that have the Rathwari system, the agricultural productivity, investment in fertilizers, et cetera, are still different. And they're different even though these places are just right next to each other. They might be a, across the border of a zamindari and a, Rathwari area, you see differences, and this, this, uh, I think we we argue is um, a result of, you know, maybe the class relations and the kind of the consequences of these kinds of institutions for the conf confidence of the of the underclass and its relationship to the elites, and I think that that argument. Uh, so I, I, I absolutely believe in the long reach of history. These, these changes, uh, the Zamindari system and the Rayapuri system were completed in India by 1857. And you look at data in 1997, you see, you know, 200, 2007, that's 150 years later, you still see consequences of that. So I, I, I'm fully a believer in the long reach of history. Now, the question is, does that mean, that does, does that have to mean determinism? Does that have to mean that we are stuck where we were, where we, uh, there's no, where there's no alternative? That in some sense, there's no point in doing policy because, you know, good policy and bad policy don't matter. What matters is what happened with the kind of institutions you get from history. And if that's the case, then in some sense, the enterprise that I'm involved in has no particular purpose. And indeed, the, the enterprise that many of you are, who are, uh, you know, working on development issues or working for the government of Bihar uh, are involved in also have no purpose because, you know, in the end, the big things can't be changed. And I want to challenge that view. So I, I think this is very much a view that, of course, comes from Marx, which is that there are immutable laws of history. It's a, it's a view that has been, uh, you know, I mentioned the work of Asimoglu and Robinson, and they have uh, they have uh, very much adopted the Marxist view. But in some sense, they are much more pessimistic than Marx, because they they want to argue. Um, Marx, in some sense, was arguing that there would be eventually a transition to socialism, or at least a transition to capitalism would be, it was inevitable, that you can't, proper capitalism will arise out of feudalism. Uh, if you think of zamindari system as being um, a particular form of feudal rule, uh, capitalism will come out of that. Now there's disputes about that. My point is not to get into the historical debates on this, but to say that uh, what, what is the more modern view is more pessimistic because it says that you know uh, you can you don't actually need uh, need uh, you you know there, there may well be that you know these transitions just don't happen there's no necessity to the transition once a, an oligarchy grabs power so you, they can just hold on to the power. They have economic power. Economic power gives you political power. Political power gives you economic power. You hold on to uh, authority. You, you don't really get change, changes. And then I think that, that view is the even more pessimistic view. There is no move away from, from oligarchic rule, from feudalism. Feudalism can be stable. Uh, there is a parallel or set of arguments which are cultural, which say that, you know, uh, 
there is trust is important, culture is important, and uh, human relationship, the culture that, uh, that uh, was formed at some point in reaction to something, but that can have durable effects. So for example, I think there's very nice work by Nathan Nunn showing that regions in Africa that sent more slaves, where there were more slave, slave uh, capturing violence. And these are often very close to each other, areas which were, uh, where had slaves and didn't. They are, there's, there's, they are poor, they're poorer, and there's less trust in those societies. People are more suspicious of others. So that's, a, that's an interesting example. Um, there's an interesting work by Botticini and Eckstein showing that you know, educational traditions in the Jewish community have persisted over thousands of years. One community was not often was deprived of its wealth, uh, of any other wealth. So they invested in education. And now that, of course, the, there is no legal way of you know appropriating the ways, ways of the Jewish community, they couldn't just hold on to wealth like everybody else, they still invest in education. So in some sense, you create out of economic necessity, you create a culture, but the culture persists. I want to argue that we do observe persistence, that was my point about the long arm of history, but it, there is no logical reason why persistence has to mean determinism. So for example, uh, things first, things could just be slow to change. We often, you know, you have to act to change. People have to decide to, you know, to make things different. And it may well be that it's just inertia that, you know, we haven't changed things because in India, I often feel that, you know, the way the government implements things is so much uh, a matter of tradition. We did things before, uh, we haven't really thought about why we did this. This was evolved in the, you know, in British times when the, uh, the, you know, the uh, the colonial white administrator was suspicious of all his brown subordinates, and he made rules to make them extremely accountable to him. And may, we, in some sense, have continued those rules, rules which are obsessively, um, you know. Uh, sort of recording oriented and uh, and I don't know whether there's we have ever really thought about why our processes are the way they are. Uh, we did some work in Bihar. We're showing that if you just change the way in which um, Emma, uh, Narega payments are sent to the village, um, instead of this is a randomized control trial made done by Jay Powell's with uh, actually the Ministry of Rural Development in Bihar, showing that when you send money directly to the village rather than sending it to the district and the block, you save lots of money. The lots of money does, doesn't get lost along the way. Somebody doesn't pocket it. So, you know, these are processes, but we set up processes for often for very simple, you know, just purely inertial reasons. In addition to that, there are often coordination failures, where which require a certain you know moment of uh, of standing back. For example, you know if I think that the other group is trying to get me, then I try to get them, and we can be fighting with, over over you know our particular parochial interests, or let's say our caste group's interests, not necessarily because that all of us. Uh, we could all be better off kind of stopping the fight for a minute and thinking about what the fight means, but it's hard to do it because we feel that as soon as I stop the fight, the other guy will take advantage of me. So you need some pause and hitting pause is often difficult. So it's not that there is anything deeply sort of fundamental in society that makes us continue doing what we are doing, but we do it because we can't hit pause. And we need leaders often to just stop us and say, "Look, you know, there, there is, there is, uh, uh, there is, uh, there is, uh, you know, let's take a, you know, uh, sort of a look back and see what, what, why we are acting the way we are." I mean, think of Gandhi as being, or and Ambedkar as being two people who essentially asked us to, to call pause on the way we have done things 
over historical uh, over the historical past. And in some sense, I think that's that's important. It's also important that even is persistent, they can be changed. And in some sense, the change is often uh, interesting. There's nice work, for example, by Kavan Munshi and, on, and, and Mark Rosenzweig uh, on caste networks in Mumbai. In caste networks in Mumbai, were very important in getting jobs. M boys from uh, certain caste, uh, families from certain castes would, would get jobs in factories because their parents, their father had a job in the factory, so they would, they would get a job in the factory. As a result, these families didn't invest much in the education of their boys. When education was a, became more available for girls, they started investing in education, education of girls because the girls didn't have secure jobs. It's precisely because the boys had secure jobs that they didn't invest in this, uh, in the education of the girls. As a result, when, for example, uh, the you know the BPOs started in Mumbai and around Mumbai, the BPOs started hiring the girls because the girls were actually went to often went to English medium schools or they were just better educated. They were focused on education. Why? Because they were not promised the jobs. In the meanwhile, as you know, the, the mills all shut down in Bombay. So you ended up with the boys actually getting hurt by their initial advantage. They were, they were advantaged by their parents. The father was privileging their children, but that privilege actually undermined them uh, in, in some interesting way. So I, I think that change is often the persistence doesn't necessarily give a guarantee that there isn't change. It's it's just the change happens in unexpected ways because certain traditions persist. I favor my boys, but that in, in the end ends up favoring my girls. Um, moreover, uh, I want to say that, you know, there doesn't, I don't actually believe that there is that much determinism. So I, I, I think that there is actually now a, a whole body of work looking at what happens to countries when leaders die. And in particular, there's, I think, the very nice work of um, Ben Jones and Ben Olken. Uh, ben jo the, is one of my students. Ben Olken is one of my colleagues at MIT. And what they show is that uh, when a leader dies, not you know, where a particular leader dies, if you look at just the effect of, of change in leaders when they die in a plane crash or some accident and a car accident, you see that countries actually perform differently after that. Sometimes you lose a good leader and things get worse. Sometimes you lose a good, bad leader and things get better. These are all deaths that would have, they're not people who got to 90 and died. Or old age, they're people who died by, uh, at an unexpected point of time um, at 45 when they died in an accident. And you see that the, those have long-term consequences. So in, in some sense, I think leadership uh, matters. What also matter, I, and, and again, despite the fact that we, 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 we have, you know, for example, in India, we have an enormous amount of kind of um, dominance of, by by the male gender in, in, built into our, many of our cultural traditions. Um, there's lots of evidence showing that mandated representation of women in, in panchayats affected political decisions. Uh, and I remember when, when this work was being done initially, everybody told us uh, that this work is pointless. We know women cannot have exercise power. Their husbands, the Pradhanpatis are exercising power. That was, uh, we were what we were told in Bengal, in Rajasthan, uh, wherever we did the work, we were told that. No, no, it's not true. When, when women are, when you change the rules, performance changes, outcomes change. Uh, you know, there's more investment in water, less investment in education. All kinds of things change. And, um, and there is similar evidence in Afghanistan, where again, when women are given power, despite it being one of the most uh, kind of traditionally oppressive societies for women, it turns out to have uh, consequences. I think that that's, a, again, I, I don't believe in determinism. I think even though our rules change, uh, 
uh, change uh, sometimes by, you know, they don't necessarily change in systematic ways and they sometimes change, um, you know, change is often slow. Uh, we, 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 we haven't yet implemented the, you know, 74th Amendment. We, this is the 73rd Amendment that, uh, that generated the Panchayati Raj. Um, it's, it, it's, it, it really does make a, make a difference. Another example is, these are interesting examples. Uh, this is an example from Melissa Delt's work. Um, she shows that uh, there was a, uh, a drought in um, Mexico uh, in uh, certain areas. Because there was a drought in those areas, uh, the political, there were, there were the political, the Mexican revolution was particularly, because there were drought in those years in Mexico, uh, the, the, in those years, that meant that in those years, there was more activism from those areas and that has had a long-term effect on those areas. So it was, so they're comparing areas <coughs> which, are next to each other. Some of them had droughts in that period. Others didn't have a drought. And if you look at the areas of the drought, they are today performing differently because essentially the revolution was much more active in those areas. People were much more upset because they were actually suffering from the drought. Um, uh, or take the example of the Mississippi floods, the areas that were more flood affected, um, basically uh, that was a time when a lot of the black population left. As a result, agriculture was modernized in those areas because the blacks were often treated as almost like machines. And uh, when they left, they modernized agriculture. Those are places that were more fair flood affected in the 19. 20s are now much more productive than the areas that were not. Accidents have long, long effects. Um, there's evidence on the beneficial impacts of wars, actually. Uh, the Besney and Person show nice evidence suggesting that countries that went into war modernized their fiscal systems faster than others that did in the 19th century. Um, so why do I say all this? I, I, I sort of um, now come, come, come a little bit closer to um, understanding. I, I say because I think not be, because I want to sort of think about the space for development work, the work that we do, many of you do, um, Shaibal did. What's the space for, uh, for development work in this world? So I, I think one can, at some level, one can never answer the question of determinism. We could say that, look, you know, yes, lots of things change, but these changes are irrelevant. Something big persists. That, you know, fine. Yes, the women are, women are, uh, women leaders are um, performed differently, but it doesn't matter because in the end, they can't change the big things. We, we, a lot of this is a bit uh, a, philo a philosophical debate that has actually no resolution. We keep can keep saying, look, you know, yes, we see some change now, but it's going to all become bad again or good again. Or, you know, there's always the option of saying the future is always going to surprise us. We don't, we, we might expect that we are, we're getting good outcomes, but in fact, we are not. They're going to all come back to some disaster. So in some sense, I don't want to say that I've settled the question of determinism, but I would say that there's not enough evidence for, for determinism for us to get, get pessimistic about it. I'm going to, I think that, I think a better use of history is to think about, you know, the, the place uh, of you know of um, of the of the nature of the way in which I think the best lesson from history is how often we've been wrong. I think, and in a sense, that's both an antidote to pessimism and optimism. But it should give us a humility. I'll give you an example. 
um, not on this slide, but it's a very good example. In 1989, the Wall Street Journal, which is a, a very free market US newspaper, celebrated its, um, its uh, 75th anniversary. And on that occasion, it decided, I'm going to predict what's going to happen. So it predicted at what growth, where will growth be? So it, it predicted that the three surprise high performers over the next 25 years will be Bangladesh, um, Bangladesh, uh, Thailand, and Zaire. No, not Zaire, uh, Zimbabwe. And if you take those three, uh, Bangladesh is actually a good performer, very good, even you could say. Thailand is mediocre, and, and Zimbabwe is a disaster. So one out of three, they got right. They also said very confidently that one country that's not going to perform well is China. This is in the Wall Street Journal, you can read the page. It says that China, because it's a, of communist rule, will fail. Uh, I, think the, I think the best lesson of history is, in some sense, I think humility. We, should, we shouldn't let history either intimidate us, but also not try to use history to, to tell us that this, this or that or other predictions will hold. I, I think we... Uh, the best thing we can do as social scientists is to have a certain amount of humility. We can say that, look, you know, we can solve specific problems sometimes. Um, the idea that we're going to just tell the shape of the hearts for the next 50 years, I mean, yeah, is, is, to me is always uh, way, way too ambitious. I, it's not what I try to do. Um, I'm, I'm inclined to be optimistic, but I would say that, you know, we, we, whether Bihar will outperform Maharashtra over the next 50 years, God knows. Um, and I think what the other thing I want to point I wanted to make is just on what what's our role as as economists, as political scientists, as as social scientists, as activists, as uh, bureaucrats, as actors, and. I think the the question is um, so this is a, this is an issue that you know I was, when I was in JNU we were already debating this where you know there was always this question should we contribute to development is that just playing into the hands of the bad guys because if you think that the you know the bad guys are ruling the state then should we try to make it a little bit better or should we just just uh, you know try to sort of, uh, you know, hold our whole, you know, just analyze, should we get involved at all? Because uh, if, you, if you get involved, you, you might end up helping the wrong people. There's always that possibility that, you know, the history is complicated. If once you take it as given, the history is complicated. Uh, should we act? So I want to argue that uh, in, in general, we have to, we have to, I think the, the most striking fact about the world in the last you know, 50 years, 20 years even, uh, is, is that the, uh, is the good news. And I'll give you a little more recent good news, which is that the, you know, if you take the 20 years leading up to the pandemic, this is not a, you know, some countries do well, some countries do badly. Uh, you know, if you look at world inequality, it's actually falling. And not just because of India and China, you know, Bangladesh and Vietnam and Cambodia and, and uh, Ethiopia and a bunch of other countries actually contribute to, to uh, the, the good news. There's in fact, Africa in the period to, to 2000 to 2020 actually does much better than between 1960 and 2000. So there's, 
But all, more remarkably, we see even in countries where, like Liberia, like Sierra Leone, where nothing particularly spectacular is happening economically, we see infant mortality dropping often by half. Between, you know, infant, infant mortality in some countries in Africa have dropped by, you know, 40, 50 percent in the last uh, in the last 20 years. Often due to very simple things like more vaccination and insecticide treated bed nets for, uh, for against malaria. I think that, that already is generating uh, large amounts of large amounts of uh, uh, increase in welfare. Maternal mortality is dropped by a, between a third and a half. These are really stunning gains in welfare. We, do, we had a, a right at the beginning we discussed the fact that you know the the Bihar is not maybe done as well as social indicators. But if you look at the overall picture, Bihar has is a much better place for to be born as a child or to have a child now than it was 20 years ago. Even so, I, I think that change, there's been lots of change, mostly for the good. The way we have disasters is in climate change. And that's something I, I, I really do worry about. But that's mostly driven by economic success. In some sense, economic failure isn't what driving this economic success is driving that. Um, you know, if you take India and you talk about the caste system, you know, I think the, uh, the first order fact, given how draconian and truly awful the, the, the Indian situation was, you know, 80 years ago in terms of discrimination, in terms of inequality of access. We've actually done a remarkable job. There's been remarkable changes. You know, you, we, we sort of, we, we, it's easy to be pessimistic and to, to, to and I, I don't want to say that we have got got anywhere we near we want to go to. I think there's tremendous, there's still discrimination, there's still tremendously unfair. Uh, the education system is tremendously unfair, I, I would still say. But with that, we, you know, the gaps have all been closing and been closing dramatically if you lo look at that. Um, if you look at gender norms, I mean, take the country where women's education it has gone ahead of men's education. That's a, a Muslim country, Bangladesh. That's a country where the women, women are now, the now fraction of women completing high school is now cross men. So these, these changes are, in the end, there is lots of change. And uh, I think we, by be, and this related point, is that I think by being too suspicious, I think we often end up end up uh, being uh, be, being um, maybe too too because we think that you know there is always the potential for the elites to capture for you know change to be defeated we're often too suspicious I, it's an example of our work in indonesia it's the work we did in indonesia a while ago we 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 did an experiment where we either let the whole village got the whole village together to to decide who were to be the beneficiaries of a anti poverty program who are the poor or we let the elites decide and the first order of fact is the elites don't decide any differently from anybody else. The second fact, perhaps more, more depressing, is that both decide extremely badly. That in a sense, what happens is, is that the data is terrible. The pe people get very bored with saying, you know, who's trying to rank people and they make mistakes. And I think we, because our bias is to assume that the biggest problem is elite capture. We designed the system to prevent elite capture. In fact, the biggest problem where you know, the data is bad, nobody knows anything, nobody actually puts enough effort into it. So there, was, there were many things we could have done, but we, because we started with the presumption that the, really, the biggest problem is elite capture, we went, uh, we went in one direction and in a sense failed uh, the people who have, who have, 
who have um, who who we were trying to help uh, by because we assume that the biggest problem is elite capture. So I think I want to emphasize that I think the way we think about the world is critical to 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 how we design policies. What's an important question? You know, should we fight um, elite capture? Should we fight bad data? And uh, it seems obvious that it should be elite capture that we fight, except that that's what, and that's what we did. But in fact, the evidence suggests that that was the wrong choice. Uh, I want to, and I think changes, I think also there's lots of evidence of change. I told you about this, uh, these work on, you know, where women become, women become panchayat heads. So, uh, the, over time, what they show is that in places where by because of the running of the lottery for the assignment of which villages get reserved uh, people were actually women were heads of the village for two consecutive sessions the third time people are much more willing to vote for women candidates even without any reservation so people's views on people's views change and i think that's a general message for many of this much of this work is that you know we we in up when we did some work during elections and we all we did we said is that don't, don't necessarily vote on vote on development issues not on caste we didn't say which caste and then we saw that there was a substantial change in the way people voted so i want to say that it's i i think that the idea that people are very very determined that determined meaning, not determined in the sense that I'm going to do things, but determined in the sense that I am a product of my history and nothing else, See, it just doesn't seem to be true. We seem to be able to generate many changes but when we try. So to conclude, I want to say that um, in, to, in the determinist view, the good news exists because now, the good news I was reporting, none of the interventions matter. The ruling, ruling elite tolerated the changes because they don't matter. Hard to falsify, but suppose this were the case. Uh, would, would we, uh, is, is, there a, is there a reason for us to hold back? Should we con continue doing what we're doing, which is trying to improve things? Or is there a reason to be uh, reason to hold back? And I want to argue that there is no particular reason to hold back. I think it, so. And I, I want three to make three points. It, I don't think that the elites are particularly. I don't think they have a unified collective interest. I don't think that they're unified. They understand their collective interests necessarily very well. I don't think they're particularly competent in holding on. Uh, they're not particularly, I think, you know, even when they are trying to hold on, it's, they're also under pressure. They also make changes. When, when Suharto, was in, Suharto was a dictator in Indonesia, when he was investing in education, he could have invested badly or he invested well. It turned out that he got advice mostly from the USAID, which made him invest in broad-based schooling, and that increased uh, GDP by a substantial amount. So it's not, I, I think the idea that uh, there, is a, uh, there is a universal plan of the elites to hold everyone down is implausible at best. So I think we should just act, we should do, uh, so I, I, I believe that as economists, our main job remains to stick up for policies which are based on economic analysis and the best data policy uh, possible are good policies. And we should not worry about the fact that, you know, it could be that this, this particular, you know, the government will take credit for it. Let it take credit for it. I don't think that we are weak. I think the standing in the way of democracy is, is, is not going to make us any more effective. Doesn't mean that we should in, in, ignore institutions, culture, politics, or other implementation, implementation constraints when we make such recommendations, just that those constraints need to be specific. 
tell us what the constraint is and we will react to it or not. We should not take as given that something bad will happen, so let's not do it. I think we, 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 we need to uh, be, we shouldn't take as given that it's all, only bad things uh, that stop good, good from happening. Uh, good often doesn't happen because we just don't, didn't think about it hard enough. We didn't do enough planning. We didn't organize well enough. That's often as important a factor in stopping good as, as the more classic factors of you know, elite, authority, uh, politics. Uh, I, I don't deny those are important, but I think that we, we, should all, we shouldn't take it as given that that's more important than getting good data, uh, you know, do, doing good research, identifying what works, pushing for it, being patient, uh, arguing for uh, our cases. You know, this, this probably, uh, the, uh, my goal here, as I said at the beginning is, I think, to promote humility, but also to guide practical action. I hope this helps. And I hope, you know, the, Spirit of Shaival will appreciate this lecture. Thank you very much. You know, uh, I, I shall start without normal addresses and anything. Um, you know, I was reminded of uh, an incident very recently. You know, this is talking about the ingenuity of uh, the underclass you know, in, in being able to thwart all your policy designs. That is something which we do not you know, take into account. But uh, I'll just, it'll take me half a minute to narrate this whole incident. We were trying to, you know, do a review of our procurement, you know, Rabi procurement recently. And um, see, normally during the course of procurement, a farmer is paid for the grains that he sells to the cooperative society. Right. I got a call from somebody, some farmer in uh, uh, one of the remoter districts saying that, uh, you know, he's not being paid. He's not been paid for his grains for over a month or something. Or something. So I immediately, and, and um, he was telling me that um, the people who are supposed to procure his grains you know, they have taken a check from him. I don't know, I don't remember correctly whether it was, um, no, I think it was a check for a certain amount or maybe it was a blank check. I, that is irrelevant. The difference is irrelevant. So I said, how, why did they take a check from you? They're supposed to give you a check because they're supposed to pay the money to you. So he said, well, that's the way it happens out here. We, we, we wouldn't be able to sell our grains unless we give a check to those guys. So I said, why do you have to give a check? I mean, I'm just not able to understand the whole uh, conundrum. So then very laboriously, he explained to me that, you know, when, see, because uh, the cooperative society functionaries want a certain cut out of the money that I get. So they, for ensuring this, they take a check from me and they encash that check in the bank, keep that bit of money that they're supposed to, you know, <clears throat> far, far, far more off from, far more off from uh, the money that I'm going to get for my grains. And then they will issue the check for my, uh, as the cost of my grains. I, I was just totally boxed out of my wits. I said, no, this, this is just not possible. I register our cooperative society to that spot the very next morning. And lo and behold, he called back. He called back his secretary, of course. And, you know, she told me that, yes, sir, what you had indicated is very much true. So I said, then do a check on the entire area and find out if this is absolutely endemic out there or what. And it so turned out that it is, it is actually endemic. That is how, that is the way the cooperative societies are functioning. 
And this comes into play, especially when the minimum support price, which has been fixed by the government, is, uh, you know, say 200 rupees above the market price. So in that 200, in that difference of 200 rupees, you know, this, this whole uh, game takes place. So it's a question of the functionaries of the cooperatives, you know, taking a part of that uh, difference. So the point that I was trying to get at is, you know, I, 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 I think uh, Professor Banerjee cho chose absolutely the most relevant topic for our state. Now, and the reason why I'm saying this is because from the example that I gave you, if you begin to get into the diagnostics of that situation, you realize that there is somewhere really the thumb of history which is working because you know these are not these are not tendencies which crop up sui generis. There is a there's a lot of network connectivity into that uh, factored into that uh, behavior, and this impacts the institutions. You know, I mean, we devised everything uh, under the cooperative umbrella to function in a certain way, but people find their own way of uh, distorting the functioning of those institutions. And why do they do that is again something which, you know, for which uh, we'll have to seek an answer in our history, in our cultural tendencies and a whole, whole lot of those uh, domains. So anyway, be that as it may, I can only say that it's, 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 it's wonderful for me to, you know, at least virtually connect with uh, Professor Banerjee and uh, we cannot- We will rejoin you at the same time. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've told Goshda yesterday only that, you know, uh, and, and um, Abhijit, do you remember when I was food secretary, I was still struggling with this, with similar issues. You had come down yes. to- you remember that? Yes. yes. So, uh, nice to see you. It's really, you know, um, very um, sort of uh, educating for all of us to you know, hear you and uh, um, as 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 policy <coughs> policy makers, I think it's very essential that we keep getting inputs from people like you every now and then, and. I think that's that's the only way we can improve the quality of our institutions, which is a very major factor in determining the overall social indicators, the outcomes in society. So thank you. Thank you once again, Professor Banerjee. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. We look forward to your coming back, coming to Bihar physically and not virtually. Man, forward... I'm all for that. But let's, uh, let's fix the pandemic first. And you know, recently... Yeah. Chief Minister was uh, taking a meeting about these uh, indicators which uh, Niti Aayog has fixed and our ranking in that, and we were doing a threadbare analysis, and we, we found that you know there was there were so many parameters on which we have been wrongly sort of you know very unjustly uh, marked. But anyway, what I'm saying is that you know the 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 whole question of the individual endowments being very, very low, how it impacts our overall growth strategy or even our growth outcomes is something which Niti Aayog has never factored, will never factor, and it will continue to weigh you know, against us. So <clears throat> anyway, that is, that is a thought I will leave for you to ponder on and to educate us and enlighten us in very near future if it will be very, very, very kind of you. We will, you know, welcome you with open arms to come and talk to us about what more Bihar needs to do within the present uh, framework, you know, of constraints as well as, you know, resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, uh, uh, it's my great privilege to propose a formal vote of thanks uh, at the end of this excellent lecture that we have. Uh, I post talk to Professor Banerjee, uh, not only for being agreeing to deliver the lecture, uh, but to, uh, be, uh, to choose a topic which I think haunts any social scientist 
time editing, time editing. Uh, frankly speaking, as you are mentioning, I have occasions to remember when some visitor will come to Shaiwan's room, either a leader or a visiting professor, or sometimes from the embassies. And after some discussions, we'll ask Shaiwan very politely, uh, Dr. Gupta, please tell me why Bihar is uh, disadvantaged or backward. Shaiwal was pretty strong in history. You must be knowing this. And Shaiwal's response will uh, depend upon history, the facts also. But he was equally mindful of the facts, which are not purely historical, but others' events uh, which had happened in Bihar and, and their addicted is uh, development part. Uh, I must also take this opportunity to tell all the uh, listeners that uh, this is an excellent beginning for uh, Shaiwal's uh, remembering Shaiwal. We <coughs> live year after year and we continue to have uh, scholars who are in the same level in which Professor Banerjee is. Uh, I also thank Dr. Harish Khare, Dr. Arik Siddharth, and C. Tupi Arishanji for making their addresses in this gathering. I also should thank uh, the listeners who have joined our program. I had expected something like five to six hundred. I'm very happy to tell you, as my colleagues inform me, we are now being joined by more than 1,000 listeners for this Shaiwal's Victoria Lecture. It's a tribute to Shaiwal, and it's also thank to Professor Banerjee, who all are looking, who are willing to hear, eager to hear to me. With these words, I thank you all again, and hope to meet sometime in future for a singular occasion. Thank you very much.